Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. My name is Leon Tyrrell and on behalf of the Indigenous Law Centre, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's open forum. We begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose traditional lands we are gathered tonight and by acknowledging and paying our respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to begin by thanking the UNSW Law School for their generous support of tonight's event and for providing us with this fantastic venue. Tonight's open forum is on the proposed changes to the hate speech provisions of the Race, Racial Discrimination Act, and in particular the implications of those reforms for Indigenous Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. There's certainly been a lot of debate and commentary about the proposed changes to Section 18C and the related provisions. And the aim tonight is to create a better understanding of the existing provisions, their history, how they op actually operate in practice. We also hope to provide greater clarity about the reforms, what they do and their consequences for, uh, for Australians. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's panel members. Our distinguished panel uh, includes firstly Dr Tim Sudpomasan, who was appointed the Race Discrimination Commissioner in August 2013. Prior to commencing in that role, he was a political philosopher at the University of Sydney. Dr Sudpomasan holds a master's degree and a doctor of philosophy from the University of Oxford and is published and presented extensively on issues of race and identity. His three books include the award-winning Don't Go Back to Where, You're Coming from, Where You Have Come From. Our next panellist, Dr Sarah Pritchard, has been at the Sydney Bar since 1999 and was appointed Senior Counsel in 2012. Dr Pritchard's many appointments include being Chairperson of the New South Wales Bar Association's Human Rights Committee and a member of the Law Council of Australia's Indigenous Legal Issues Committee. Dr Pritchard has a long association with the UNSW Law School as a postdoctoral fellow, a senior lecturer and director of the Australian Human Rights Centre and Diplomacy Training Program. Her extensive practice includes discrimination law in relation to which she's appeared before Australia's High Court. Bindi Cole is a Melbourne-based award-winning photographer, curator and new media artist. Her works have been exhibited in the National Gallery of Australia the Gallery of Modern Art Queensland, the Art Gallery of Western Australia and in private collections in Australia and the United Kingdom. She is a talented and resilient artist with Wada Wurrung heritage who speaks compellingly about taboo topics through her photographs, videos and installations. Bindi's work exposes the questions that most are afraid to ask. And finally, tonight's forum will be chaired by the Director of the Indigenous Law Centre Professor Megan Davis. Professor Davis is a UN expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, a commissioner of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. Professor Davis teaches, writes and researches in the areas of public law, international law and the law as it affects, as it affects Indigenous peoples. As many of you will know, Professor Davis is also a, a prolific and highly engaging uh, tweeter. If there were a, a Twitter Olympics, I'm quite confident that Megan would probably tweet for Australia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so please join me in welcoming our, um, our panellists and Megan will then uh, begin the session. Thank you, Leon. There are people that tweet far more than I do. Um, <laughs> So thank you everybody for uh, coming tonight and especially to our, um, uh, I was going to say contestants, but I mean <laughs> panellists. <laughs> um, uh, the format for tonight is that um, it uh, is meant to be an informal, relatively casual conversation about uh, Section 18C and then we'll open it up to questions um, to the floor. And I think the podcast is running now. Beck. Yep. Yep. So... Um, I think we'll start uh, with you, Tim. Um, are you able to, or can you tell us about the history and purpose of Section 18C? Uh, when was it enacted and, and what was the purpose of it? 
So the, the Racial Discrimination Act has been around since 1975, but Section 18C has only been there since 1995, and its introduction to the law was a response from the federal government of the time to rising community concern about racist violence and racial vilification. You had a number of major reports and inquiries, including the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, National Inquiry into Racist Violence, conducted by uh, then Race Commissioner Irene Moss, the Australian Law Reform Commission conducted a report into multiculturalism and the law as well. And, and these major inquiries and reports recommended that there should be laws addressed at racial vilification. Uh, I think there was growing concern at the time that incidents such as the fire bombing of, of, of Chinese uh, restaurants, the desecration of, of, of Jewish cemeteries, uh, among other things, uh, was a sign that Australian society couldn't be complacent about the social evil of racism. So Section 18C uh, exists to ensure that vilification does not escalate uh, to violence, and it's a recognition that uh, the law, uh, without such explicit provisions concerning vilification, may not be able to provide redress for people who are abused or harassed on racial grounds. Okay. Um, and we'll return to what is a significant point you've made there, which is the number of inquiries and public inquiries and consultation that went into um, Section 18C. Tim, are you able to tell us um, what other changes being proposed to uh, Section 18C? It might be useful maybe just to make clear what Section 18C says, and, and the section makes unlawful any act that's reasonably likely to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate a person or group of people on the grounds of race or ethnicity. Uh, Section 18C is also accompanied by Section 18D, which protects a number of, uh, of, of, of activities on the grounds of free speech. So if you do anything that's artistic expression, that's scientific or academic inquiry, or that's fair reporting or fair comment on a matter of public interest, uh, then that will not be held in breach of Section 18C provided that it's done reasonably and in good faith. Uh, the federal government, through its exposure draft of proposed amendments, which it released at the end of March this year, has proposed a number of things. One is to effectively delete the words offend, insult and humiliate from Section 18C and introduce new prohibitions targeted at anything that vilifies on the grounds of race and anything that intimidates on the grounds of uh, of race. Uh, in addition, uh, there's, without going uh, through, through it all too quickly at once, uh, in addition there's a new test for whether something contravenes the law, which uh, involves a, a test of the ordinary reasonable person uh, who's a member of the Australian community and uh, it's a test that has no reference to the uh, membership of uh, a person of an ethnic or racial uh, group. Uh, now there's uh, another big provision that's been proposed by the government which is a category of exception for anything that's done in the course of participation in public discussion. Um, and what that means is that uh, if there is anything that's done uh, for the purpose of public discussion, even if it should have the effect of uh, vilifying or intimidating uh, someone, and we can come back to how that's defined um, a bit later, uh, uh, then it will not be held as unlawful conduct and the effect of that proposal is to remove the requirements of reasonableness and good faith which currently uh, exist in Section 18C. Uh, um, but needless to say, there's been a lot of community concern about the impact of what has been proposed. Yeah. Um, <coughs> keep having to turn around. To talk to me. Um, we might just quickly move on to uh, Bindi because we know that the trigger for these amendments uh, was the Andrew Bolt case. Um, Bindi, can you tell us a bit about that litigation and perhaps not so much from a legal p perspective but in terms of uh, the personal or emotional impact um, of that case and what was written about you? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Andrew Bolt began writing about me probably two years prior to actually beginning the court case. Um, he wrote about me numerous times um, on his blog. 
he kind of made me the poster child for the white Aboriginal person. Um, he had never met me, nor spoken to me, nor spoken to anybody that had ever met me. Um, and he would write things and then hundreds of people would get up onto his blogs and make comments as well. And he um, would create this kind of wave of hatred spewed at me that was everything from I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm a victim, I'm mental, um, I'm not really Aboriginal, I'm opportunistic, the only reason I identify as being Aboriginal is because I'm opportunistic, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I came to his attention because of an artwork that I made, which was actually called Not Really Aboriginal, and it was about being a fair-skinned Wadawurrung woman and knowing that as I identified, um, people would say to me, but you're not really Aboriginal. And I already knew that uh, one of the reasons they would say that is because they thought that the only reason I'm saying that is because I'm opportunistic. So I made a series of artworks with myself and my family in blackface to kind of turn myself into the stereotype that I thought everybody wanted to see. And it was specifically about those two attitudes. And then Andrew Bolt saw that and went, ah, oh, but she's not really ab Aboriginal. <laughs> and she's only saying she is because she's opportunistic. So in one sense, that was a very successful artwork. <laughs> um, and then he wrote about me. And over the course of that two years, uh, personally, it really affected me. Um, there were days when I didn't want to leave the house. There were days that I would just cry and cry and cry. Um, I actually think I lost community standing and opportunities because people would um, buy into what he was writing. Uh, and I had to go through a, a really tough time, I suppose, of, um, of working out how to be in public and be in my world. <clears throat> And so it was very, very difficult. And I was all of the things that the, the Racial Discrimination Act sets out. I was offended, I was humiliated, I was intimidated too. I, I, I was fearful of going into public situations. I'm not anymore, but in that process I was. And, um, and I think for somebody like me who doesn't have, who, who, where the power balance is so out of whack, he has so much power and I have so little power. I have a very small platform and he has a very large platform these particular laws are so vital. They provide a safe and protected avenue for someone like me to have recourse, to stand up and, and go, this is not right. It's not right that somebody can vilify me publicly without ever even knowing me, without even doing any correct research. And um, I'm so thankful that these laws exist. Thank, thank you, Benny, and thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we'll return a bit later to speak about your current exhibition. Um, but on uh, the, the current amendments, um, uh, I'd like to ask a question of Sarah. Um, Sarah, uh, you've had an involvement in the, the, the writing of the submission of the Law Council of Australia and the New South Wales Bar Association on the Attorney General's exposure draft bill. What are some of the concerns um, that both the Law Council and the Bar, um, New South Wales Bar, have raised uh, with respect to the draft bill? Um, and in addition to that, what are some of the recommendations that they've made on the proposed amendments? Thanks, Megan. Well, first of all, I can't speak for the Law Council. I'm a member of uh, several Law Council committees, but I uh, speak for the New South Wales Bar Association, which is one of the constituent bodies of the Law Council. We, um, and I don't speak in my own capacity, I speak as the chairperson of a committee that over a course of uh, a month developed a position, put it to the Bar Council, our governing body, to the executive. So there's a, quite a process which leads to a body like the Bar Association formalising a position. Uh, the position which we ultimately reached was that the government hasn't made out uh, a case for amending the existing provisions in Part 2A of the RDA. Uh, we noted in our submission that voters apparently feel much the same way and referred to a uh, poll in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald on the 20th of April, 
which had 88% of those polled supporting the existing text of Section 18C. The, the existing formulation of 18C was polled and 88% of those polled supported it. We um, considered that as a matter of uh, process and a proper rigorous approach to law reform that um, there needed to be a um, comprehensive review of alleged deficiencies in the operation of the existing provisions and there hasn't been such a comprehensive review. We considered that such a process of re review should be undertaken by an independent expert body such as the Australian Law Reform Commission which would receive uh, submissions from interested individuals and uh, organisations uh, putting evidence in relation to the perceived problems in the operation of the existing uh, provisions. Uh, we were through our own uh, research over the course of a month uh, unable to identify any evidence of the so-called chilling effect of the existing provisions uh, and uh, we considered all the explanatory material which preceded the uh, adoption uh, or enactment of part 2A and uh, formed the view, as have numerous judges of the Federal Court in considering that explanatory material, that the existing provisions were developed with a keen awareness of the need to balance considerations of freedom of speech and um, uh, prescription of racial vilification. Uh, we also reviewed uh, existing cases, jurisprudence, and came to the view that the courts have um, displayed uh, remarkable conservatism in applying uh, the provisions in Part 2A, Sections uh, 18B uh, to 18E. Um, and while we recognise, as, as many do, that the language of 18C is broad, particularly the words insult and offend, that the courts have conservatively and sensibly found contraventions of the sections only in cases of profound and serious effects and not in cases involving mere slights. Um, if I could just very briefly address the, the concrete um, proposals. Uh, first of all, um, we came to the view that the, the new section, because it's proposed to remove the entirety of part 2A and insert a single new section, that um, the combined effect uh, is to limit protection against intimidation to where the relevant hate speech causes fear of threat of physical harm to persons or property and against vilification to incitement of hatred. And um, one finds a definition of uh, vilify as incitement of racial hatred and that uh, definition bears no relationship to its ordinary meaning uh, in, of speech that degrades or denigrates and in relation to the limit, limitation of intimidate to physical harm, we concluded that this uh, excludes forms of intimidation that do not involve fear of physical harm, such as psychological harm and is at odds with international practice. Uh, we concluded that the protection afforded by the exposure draft is significantly narrower than that provided required by Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which um, prohibits the advocacy of racial hatred. And we also concluded that it is uh, significantly narrower than that uh, afforded by Section 20C of the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act. Uh, as to the amendment which requires the court um, to have regard to uh, a representative member of the Australian community at large rather than a representative member of the community affected, we uh, concluded that that seems particularly problematic uh, and difficult and suggesting that victims of racial hatred may not be ordinary, reasonable members of the Australian community is uh, uh, even more difficult and problematic. And uh, finally, in relation to the new uh, excep exception which is intended, in a sense, to replace uh, Section 20D, which is so often overlooked in discussion, sorry, not 20C, 18D, which is so often overlooked in discussion of 18C, uh, we concluded that its effect is to deprive the prescription in the new uh, provision of any 
meaningful content whatsoever. And um, we con concluded that the uh, removal of requirements of good faith and um, reasonableness are um, utterly unacceptable. Thank, Thank you, Megan. You. Tim, did you want to add anything to Sarah's analysis? Well, the, the Australian Human Rights Commission in its submission also said that uh, the exposure draft should not proceed. Uh, I've made clear my concerns as race discrimination commissioner about the potential effects of the exposure draft if it were to be enacted. Uh, my concerns uh, map onto what uh, Sarah has, has just outlined. Uh, I would also add there's a very real social danger of signalling to a small minority of Australians with bigoted attitudes that they have complete freedom to abuse and harass others on racial grounds in the name of free speech. Uh, and we should not be complacent about the danger of offering licence to bigotry and racial hatred. Can you um, tell us a little bit about the actual practice um, of the section, because we haven't, I mean, Sarah's touched upon it. How many cases are we dealing with and um, how does the Commission actually deal with the complaints? So last financial year we received 192 complaints concerning racial hatred under Section 18C. What happens when someone makes a complaint alleging a breach of the Racial Discrimination Act, and this includes under, under Part 2A, uh, is uh, that the Australian Human Rights Commission will attempt to conciliate the matter. So we'll uh, contact the uh, respondent party, try and bring the complaint and respondent together in a room so that they can talk through uh, the matter. Uh, part of uh, the, the reason of doing this is because the law is designed as a civil and educative uh, mechanism for dealing with matters of racial vilification. So contrary to a lot of the public commentary which refers to people being prosecuted or people being convicted uh, under Section 18C, uh, the law operates uh, as a civil law. Uh, you cannot be convicted of a breach of Section 18C. If someone makes a complaint, all it means is that you have to enter into conciliation. Now, we successfully conciliate matters in the majority of cases that, that come to us at the Australian Human Rights Commission. So last financial year of those 192 complaints, we successfully conciliated in about 53% of those cases. Uh, only 3% of cases ended up in court for uh, judgment by the federal court or the federal circuit court. Uh, when we resolve complaints, what usually happens is the respondent party will acknowledge the uh, harm caused by their conduct and will offer an apology or a statement uh, amounting to, to an apology. Uh, if it's an organisation, for example, that's a respondent, uh, part of the remedy may involve the organisation changing their practices or policies. Uh, in some cases there's a payment of uh, damages or compensation as well. But that's how the law operates. Um, you can't be <laughs> convicted or prosecuted. So, so Tim, obviously everybody talks about the Bolt case with respect to this, but what are some of the, can you give us some examples of the sorts of complaints that do come mm. before you? So the Bolt case hasn't been the only case that's gone to court under Section 18C. I, um, I, I, I'd like to point out at the outset, uh, over the almost 20 years that the law has been in operation, uh, there, there's been a, about 100 determinations and judgments um, concerning Section 18C, uh, and in about half the cases um, the, the complaint uh, was... Uh, was, was found to, to be of substance or upheld by um, a court. Uh, to give you some uh, e examples of how the law has um, operated, um, as, as Sarah highlighted, courts have made very clear that uh, there will only be a finding of a breach of Section 18C if the conduct involves anything that causes serious and profound effects rather than just hurt feelings um, or mere slights. Um, the most, one of the more famous uh, cases uh, would be um, the one involving Frederick uh, Tobin uh, and uh, content that he put up on his Adelaide Institute uh, website, which uh, involved, among other things, a denial that the Holocaust 
had taken place and other virulently anti-Semitic material. Uh, in, in Dr Tobin's uh, case, he was uh, found not to have uh, been able to enjoy the protections of 18D because he did not act reasonably uh, or in good faith. Uh, but you've had other cases where Section 18D has uh, effectively served to trump Section 18C. Um, I think of the case involving Pauline Hanson, uh, where uh, an Aboriginal person put forward a complaint alleging that a book Pauline Hanson had written, The Truth, uh, offended, insulted and humiliated Aboriginal people because uh, it included uh, arguments that uh, Aboriginal people enjoyed special privileges or special treatment. Uh, the court in that case found that uh, the material in that book was uh, protected. It was a protected form of speech um, because uh, it, it was, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, something done in good faith by uh, Ms Hanson, uh, regardless of uh, the fact that the complainant may have been offended or insulted on, on racial grounds. Uh, there's another, um, I'll make this the last example without going through the whole um, catalogue of, of things, but uh, another prominent or useful example rather of, of how 18D operates is uh, uh, the case of Kelly Country and Beers, which uh, involved a comedic performer who went under the name uh, King Billy Coke Bottle. Uh, this was um, a person who dressed up as an Aboriginal person and painted uh, themselves in, in blackface. Uh, an Aboriginal person made a complaint alleging that, uh, uh, that they were offended, insulted and humiliated by the performance because the performer had depicted Aboriginal people as uh, dirty, ill-educated, drunk, uh, among other things. Uh, the court in that case uh, found that, um, that that was protected speech uh, given that it was a comedic uh, performance. Um, but I hope those examples give you some sense of the case uh, law that has existed during the past two decades and the very broad application of 18D by the courts in protecting freedom of expression and speech. And I'll return to that issue at the very end, but I wanted to ask uh, Bindi, can you tell us about your current exhibition? Um, because it's related obviously to the, the, this issue. Um, well, I've got a new work in the current exhibition, which is called Hashtag 18C. So, yes, it's related. <laughs> um, and it's a video and installation, and it's a video of um, a man sitting there in a suit with a paper bag over his head that has the word bigot emblazoned across it. And um, I come into, this, into the, um, the view and I, I kneel at his feet and wash his feet. And then I walk away. And alongside that is the hat with the, or the paper bag with the word bigot on it. And everybody's invited to put on the paper bag and take a selfie and exercise their right to be a bigot um, and upload that if they want to. Um, I'm still anxiously awaiting people to do this. I think it's a little bit intimidating for people. Um, but the reason that I made that work was because as somebody who's suffered uh, racial vilification. Um, I have obviously had the recourse of going through the legal system and that's been fantastic um, because I got to stand up for myself and my community and say that this is not on and I'm so pleased that we did that. But on the flip side, as a woman, as a, as a, as a human, I still need to then deal with the residual effects of that discrimination and um, for me to deal with that, I need to... Um, I guess forgive and redeem and um, personally go through a process of, of, of catharsis of, of letting that out and and so that video is very much about that but also about the fact that um, I guess at, at the end of the day we are all humans and we should all be treating each other well and this it's just a sad sorry state of affairs that we've come to this place where we think that the bully has more rights than the victim, you know, and um, and I worry about that, particularly as there's so many vulnerable people in the community who might not be able to deal with it in the way that I did. There's so much suicide and, and, and depression and, and low self-worth, and I think we need to be putting more protections in place, not less. How does it feel to know that the law that achieved uh, justice for what was written about you is under threat? 
Well, up until now, I haven't really stood up and talked about the case, the, um, the court case, and the um, the experience that I went through. But I feel like now is the perfect time because it feels terrible that they're trying to change these laws. We need these safe and protected avenues to go through. There needs to be legal recourse for people who don't have the opportunity to fight back um, or to stand up. Or, or There needs to be protection and so now is the right time for me to get up and come out and speak against this stuff and, and share my experience because it needs to be heard. I'm very glad that you are. Thanks. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Sarah, um, it's been argued by uh, the Freedom Commissioner, Tim Wilson, that one of the reasons um, against having Section 18C is that Australia has a race power in its constitution, Section 5126, um, um, and he's argued that Section 18C would prevent um, uh, public discussion on, on the race power. Um, what would your response be to that? Uh, well, first of all, my response will be my personal one. I can't speak for my professional association uh, at this point. I'm not sure, Megan, that I really um, understand the point that's being made because all around Australia, for the last two years, people have been talking about the race power in the context of discussion of constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians without there being any suggestion that Section 18C is somehow infringed. Um, so I, I'm not sure I, I understand the suggestion. But, but to the extent that it's suggested that the race power, um, sorry, that 18C somehow impedes discussion about amendment of Section 5126 of the Constitution, I have to respectfully disagree, um, both having regard to the text of Section 18C and the text of Section 18D and the decisions of the courts, including the full court of the federal court in relation to both. I think it's a um, fairly, um, with respect, fanciful um, suggestion. For example, just to um, refer to very, uh, Tim has helpfully and, and with respect <laughs> admirably summarised some of the jurisprudence in relation to 18C and, and 18D. But it has been consistently held um, that the words offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate in Section 18C are words which require profound and serious effects, not mere slights. Um, in Brofo, for example, a decision of that, that was a decision of um, Justice Kiefel, who's now on the High Court in um, Creek and Cairns Post, and that approach was confirmed by Justice French, who's now the Chief Justice of the High Court, when he was a member of the full court of the Federal Court in Brofo. He endorsed that test, and it's been consistently applied. Uh, also in Brofo, in relation to Section 18D, Justice, J Justice French, as he then was, laid down what is now the um, accepted test in relation to Section 18D, and he there confirmed that Section 18D, the freedom of speech provision, as he refers to it, rather than the exception to 18C, should be construed um, broadly rather than narrowly, so we have a very broad uh, provision in Section 18D allowing for artistic expression and fair comment, accurate reporting, uh, public discussion, subject, of course, to reasonableness and um, good faith requirements. Uh, Justice French emphasised elements of rationality and proportionality, and something would be protected by Section 18D if it bears a rational relationship to uh, those uh, purposes, in the case of academic, artistic or scientific purposes. Um, and he emphasised that um, um, on the other hand, um, 18D offers a warning that game playing at the margins of a statutory prescription or obligation may attract a finding of liability. Uh, those, the very helpful analysis by Justice French was applied faithfully by Justice Bromberg in um, the Bolt.
decision and his honour there in his reasons gave a detailed uh, analysis of jurisprudence and applied faithfully that jurisprudence uh, in, in that case in relation to section 18D. So any well, polite, or well, that doesn't even have to be polite, the cases have said it can be impolite, but any discussion about the race power which abides by those um, prescriptions uh, will not fall foul of part uh, two way of the Racial Discrimina Discrimination Act, in my opinion. I mean, I suppose one of the last questions before we open up to the audience for you, Tim. Um, we, the, the Attorney General says that the uh, um, amendments will toughen the Racial Discrimination Act and the way to deal with racism is not to censor and that this Section 18C does have a negative impact on, on free speech. Um, what is your response um, as the Race Discrimination Commissioner to those who argue that the section is racist um, and that the section does impact on free speech? Well, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that characterisation. I, I don't think the law has a chilling effect on free speech. It's one of the few provisions of Australian law that explicitly protects freedom of speech. And it's one thing, I think, to say, well, we don't need laws to fight racism. You can just speak back and exercise your own freedom of speech if you're speaking from a position of social power or privilege. But if you're speaking up to someone if you're from a vulnerable or marginalised position, you may not be able to speak back effectively. And I think to suggest that merely speaking back is going to be enough and that you don't need the power of the law behind you um, ignores uh, the fact that uh, a riposte to racism when one is subjected to racial abuse does not heal the wound of racial abuse. And if you know anyone who's been subjected to a, a racial tirade in a public place will know that offering a well-reasoned rebuttal based on reason is going to do nothing to persuade the other person to change their mind immediately. And that's why the law plays a powerful role. It, it broadcasts our commitment to certain values and it says that it's not acceptable for you to racially abuse and harass someone. And as for free speech um, and restrictions on free speech, we have all sorts of restrictions on our ability to speak in public. Uh, parliaments at state and federal level have standing orders that say you can't use offensive language or words. Uh, there are criminal summary offence laws, which mean that you can be convicted for using offensive language in a public place. Uh, you know, last year in New South Wales alone, according to Luke McNamara and Kath Gelber, 12,000 people were convicted under criminal summary offence laws for using offensive language. We have defamation laws, which mean you can't offend people's reputation without perhaps being liable for six-figure damages. Uh, Ray Hadley had to fork out $288,000 for calling a woman a silly grub. We had Fairfax, um, uh, and three defendants uh, in, in that case being liable for uh, $180,000 of damages each for saying of a restaurant here in Sydney that it was a blight on the culinary landscape uh, of the city. Now, if we are prepared to accept that our own parliamentarians must withdraw from using offensive language, if we can accept that you can be convicted under criminal summary offence laws for using offensive words in public places, if we can accept that you can fork out six-figure damages for calling someone silly or saying that a restaurant is not particularly good, then I think we can also accept that you can hold someone accountable if they racially abuse and harass you in public. Yeah, that's awesome. Final question to all the panellists. Um, you may or may not feel like answering it. Certainly something that I'm sure we'll discuss in question time. But um, given this, uh, the controversy around Section 18C and the, the, the controversy that the changes have excited and the importance of Section 18C um, and more broadly racial uh, non-discrimination to the Australian community, um, does that not give traction to the argument for a constitutional non-discrimination clause with this forthcoming constitutional recognition project. And I, and I note that one of the recommendations of the expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution was for a, uh, a racial non-discrimination clause in the constitution. In fact, the only 
a recommendation uh, that the expert panel made that received about 80% support from the Australian population. Um, and, and I suppose corollary to that is how can the federal government execute recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Australian constitution, whatever form that might take, um, but this notion of recognition of our first peoples while at the same time advocate for for one of a better phrase, the right to be a bigot or the right to bigotry. Um, so I invite each of you to maybe uh, make some comment, closing comment on that question. Okay, I'll kick it off. Um, uh, okay, I, I, I think it's important to send a, an unambiguous signal about equality and non-discrimination at all levels of our society. That it's at the everyday level, that we all as individuals, um, you know, that we all as individuals um, show decency and respect uh, to, to others that we encounter in, in our lives. Uh, that as a society we have laws uh, that address uh, problems of, of racial discrimination, um, and also I think um, it's an, it should be uh, also appropriate for the supreme law of our country or our founding document, whatever you may want to call the Constitution, to reflect our commitment uh, to non-discrimination and equality. Uh, I think there are two debates happening at the moment, uh, though, one concerning 18C and the Racial Discrimination Act, uh, which should be held distinct um, from a second debate about constitutional uh, recognition, but I do note that uh, many others have, um, have, have certainly said, uh, said, um, said that there may be tensions in, in what is happening at the moment in the public debate concerning those issues. Including a very important comment, I thought, from Senator Nova Paris about that very issue. Wendy, did you have any... What he, what he said. What he said, that's but, fine. But I, I think I, I don't really... I'm going to be a bit ignorant, but I don't really understand what you mean by a non-discrimination clause. Can you explain it to me? Essentially, when um, the, the, I'm not sure if uh, you know, but the Prime Minister constituted about three years ago, I, I think, an expert panel to travel around Australia to um, consult with the Australian community and Aboriginal communities about recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. Um, and as a consequence of all of those consultations and, and public submissions from the public, um, one of the, the, the key recommendations of the expert panel was that in the Constitution we have a, uh, a, a commitment to racial non-discrimination. That is a commitment um, by the Australian people, by the Federal Parliament, to not discriminate against people on the basis of their race. Out of all of our recommendations, that was the one recommendation that um, polled the highest. Um, and in the polling that we did, we were told that would be the only of our, one of our options that would get across the line in a referendum, that it was uh, robust enough to sustain a no case. Um, and so that's part of, I mean, I don't think the recognition, uh, I don't think there's a debate yet because there's no proposal on the table, but a significant part of this recognize, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution is is about having a non-discrimination provision in the Constitution. So, but we can chat about that a bit more in question time, I think. If... Yeah, I would agree with that. I just think there's absolutely no place in our community, in our society, for this type of speech. And we need to be protecting people as much as possible. Sarah? Uh, very briefly, if, if I might, on this occasion I can happily uh, speak for the Law Council of Australia rather than the New South Wales Bar Association because the Law Council's submission to the expert panel strongly supported a uh, constitutional um, prohibition on racial discrimination having regard to the fact that Section 5126 has been consistently interpret interpreted by the High Court to a, 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 a provide a... Uh, legislative basis for both um, beneficial as well as adverse laws and also having regard to the fact that since 1975 and the enactment of the RDA the states and territories have been subject to an effect effectively a constitutional prohibition on state and territory legislation which is racially discriminatory so what's the principal basis for not extending such a, um, a limitation upon the legislative powers of the Commonwealth? Well, Beck, that's the end of our 
discussion up here. Did you want to grab a microphone and we'll take questions from the floor? Um, any questions? Well, that's not really a question for a lawyer, is it? That's a question for someone who's politically active. And um, I think there are certain constraints upon Tim's capacity to answer that question. And there are certain constraints upon, upon mine this evening. Uh, perhaps um, it might be of interest to those here that there are uh, leaders of the various ethnic communities amongst the audience who've been participating in the political side of things. So I don't know if any... Oh, look, I, mean, I, I just think it's important that anyone who's concerned about the issue makes clear their concern, whether that's to the Prime Minister, the Attorney General or your federal member of parliament. Um, this is a, a, a public debate and um, all Australian citizens and residents should be free to express their freedom of speech on this issue. Can, can, I, just, can I say one thing in relation to the law reform process, the procedural aspect of it? The, um, Attorney has received five and a half thousand. Is that right, Peter? More than five and a half thousand submissions in relation to the exposure draft. And ordinarily, in a process of uh, law reform, submissions would be publicly available so that everybody could read them and follow the arguments for and against. But in this instance, they're not publicly available, and um, that's something which I regard. And Hi, I was just wondering, um, we're obviously speaking about the importance of keeping 18C and, and I obviously really support that, but I was also curious to know whether or not you all think that the protection provided in 18C is adequate or whether there's actually room to improve the protections under 18C. Uh, well, uh, the current uh, legislation does not in include a criminal prohibition uh, of, of racial vilification uh, and Australia's international obligations under the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination require uh, signatory or the obligations include um, uh, criminalising uh, racist uh, conduct. Uh, Australia has taken out or has a reservation taken out uh, with respect to the relevant article, Article 4. Uh, that is one area uh, where, you, where you can see an improvement, but that should not be, I should make very clear, uh, at the expense of the current civil provision, which ensures that you do have an educative mechanism for, for handling racism. Uh, in terms of how the law operates, uh, people uh, under-report racist conduct um, now, whether or not this points to a, a weakness of the law per se, I think is, is open to, to a debate. Uh, but I think it is worth pointing out that you know, 192 complaints in Australia is not necessarily indicative of the prevalence of racist uh, conduct in contemporary society. So, uh, so I, I don't think we're seeing um, a good reflection of, of people's experience of racial discrimination day to day in the number of complaints that we receive under the law. With the uh, growing of cyberspace uh, in terms of racism, 
Do you see any additional provisions that we might uh, put into the current legislation to counter that? Uh, in, in terms of cyber racism, this is an emerging challenge. Uh, we received a 59% increase in the number of racial vilification complaints under 18C last financial year, and a lot of that can be explained by the uh, increased level of uh, racist conduct on social media and on video sharing uh, websites. Um, I, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's an emerging uh, issue and uh, certainly open to debate whether uh, the, the law responds adequately uh, to it. Um, but I think we might need perhaps a bit more time to know uh, whether or not uh, 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 internet service providers or, or platform um, providers are responding adequately uh, to this problem because obviously the law, uh, while important, does not exhaust the, uh, the mechanisms by which people can respond to cyber racism. Can I ask a question? Is that all right? <laughs> um, when you make, when people make complaints through the Human Rights Commission, is it only the people who've been vilified and affected who can make the complaint, or can other people, if can they make a complaint on someone's behalf, or if they're outraged by something themselves, can they report even though they're not impacted by it? Um, the, uh, you need to be a member of the aggrieved. Uh, uh, group in order to make a complaint. Um, so, um, uh, uh, for, for argument's um, sake, um, I, I would be unable, as, as someone um, from um, a Chinese and, and Lao ethnic uh, background, to put forward a complaint on behalf of uh, someone of Sudanese uh, background, for, for argument's sake. Any more questions, Vic? Oh, one over Allowing the public vilification of people racially is only going to send a message to everybody else that this is fine in every area of life. And so my feeling would be that racism would increase on every level, everywhere. And that's very worrisome. Hmm. I'll add one thing, which is that the Racial Discrimination Act contains provisions directed at discrimination uh, concerning employment. Uh, but there's no doubt that if there is to be a dilution or weakening of uh, laws concerning racial vilification, there is a very real risk uh, that you will change the atmospherics in society and give licence for people to say things against people on the basis of race in a public place, including uh, in workplaces. Um, and it's uh, worth bearing in mind that when it concerns complaints, under the Racial Discrimination Act uh, as, a, as a statute in general, uh, employment uh, does dominate the uh, area of, of complaints that we receive. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, the, the Australian Human Rights Commission in, in its submission has expressed its concern about the deletion of uh, 18E. It's not clear uh, exactly why the, the government has proposed in its exposure draft uh, the deletion of uh, that section. And it, there may well be implications for 
uh, the workplace uh, uh, with respect to employer liability. Um, there's also a question to be asked about whether it can impact the reach of the RDA uh, with respect to uh, cyber racism and the publication uh, of material on the internet. Um, but that's that's an uncertainty that, um, uh, uh, rather than um, rather than a, a firm judgment on my part. Any more questions? Oh, one more. No. <laughs> um, um, oh, I, I think it's safe to assume, unless we are advised otherwise, that the federal government still intends to proceed with amending the Racial Discrimination Act. The attorney also said something quite curious last week, and that was that uh, the debate is, uh, is, needs to be recast in terms of freedom of opinion, freedom of intellectual opinion. And that seems a little bit odd because opinion is something that one holds in private and uh, the 18C doesn't intrude upon that at all. So it's not quite clear to me what the significance of that recasting of the debate is. Can we switch off the podcast now? Um, uh, I've just returned from four weeks at the Permanent Forum uh, in New York at, at the UN, and it was people had heard about it. People had um, um, it was raised a number of times, including by some First Nations, um, Indigenous people, um, of course. Australian Indigenous people in the Pacific Caucus. So there's a lot of concern around the world from um, the different Indigenous uh, uh, global, the, the different regions about uh, the watering down of the racial verification laws in Australia. So, um, I mean, up until recently, when you did do this UN work, Pauline Hanson is still, you know, frequently um, discussed at that level. And I know during my bilaterals for my election to the Economic and Social Council that it was raised by many of the states, 54 states of ECOSOC anyway, in, my, um, in those discussions. Um, so people are keenly aware about, um, uh, in particular, at Indigenous issues um, at that level. But we, we did hear numerous comments um, during the course of the meeting about Australia's new right to bigotry or Australia's new right to be a bigot. So it, it's interesting. I, I did think it was interesting the way that it's already permeated at that, at that level. It's amazing that that quote has gone around. <laughs> it, it, it's gone viral, yeah. It's yeah. Very... <laughs> God. What a great thing to be known for. Okay, well, we might wrap it up now because I'm sure everybody's dying for champagne. Um, um, thank you all for coming tonight and participating. Um, but I, I'm sure you'll join with me. This discussion is extremely important. Um, we're really appreciative that you guys took the time, Tim, Bindi, Sarah, to come and speak to everyone tonight. And um, we did get a lot of demand with respect to filming and podcast from, from the community. So um, fortunately that has, has now been done and will be um, uh, uh, communicated. Um, so thank you. Would you all join with me in thanking our panelists? <laughs> and, and I do believe we have gifts for our panelists. Um, and while Beck is 
handing out the gifts. Um, we're doing just a launch following on from this of our two journals for 2014, the Indigenous Law Bulletin and the Australian Indigenous Law Review. Um, and there's drinks and nibblies as well. So please feel free to come up to level two um, to the Law Common Room to, to, to join.